Well, I have, uh, I think it's about 6.31, maybe? Is that about 6.32? Okay, well, we better, we better get rolling. Uh, glad to see folks here in person. Glad the folks that are watching this uh, online on Facebook. We're welcome to you guys. And uh, we are going to continue to work our way through or read our way through Paul's two letters to the church at Corinth, the first and second Corinthians. And last week, if you just remember, we, uh, we looked at chapter 7 and 8. 7 is uh, where Paul gave his opinion about marriage, which was not, as we said, maybe a ringing endorsement. Um, he was kind of saying, well, if you have to, or if you must. Um, because, as we said, Paul was really thinking that they were living in what we might call the end days or the end times. He thought the return of Jesus was imminent and thought that... Uh, Getting entangled in things like marriage was probably uh, not the best idea, but he said, you know, if you can't uh, kind of control yourselves, uh, it's better to be married than to be, uh, you know, full of uh, desire that you don't know what to do with. So he kind of gave a grudging approval to marriage and said, I, I, I wish everybody was like me, which we assume was a widower or perhaps even someone whose wife had left him because of his um, desire to journey from town to town and not ever settle down and uh, we don't know Paul never makes reference to a wife although he as a self-proclaimed Pharisee probably at some point in his life was married but so he gives a sort of conditional approval to marriage that in his later letters becomes a much more full-throated endorsement of marriage in his in his later letters this is one of his earlier letters Chapter 8, you know, we talked about this rather esoteric topic of whether or not a Christian should eat food that had been uh, used in a pagan sacrifice. Um, and uh, he comes out and says, well, those gods that, those, that the animals are sacrificed to don't exist. Uh, God made the meat, so uh, there's no harm in eating the meat that had been used in a pagan sacrifice and then sold at the temple butcher shop. But, he says, some of your more soft-hearted uh, new Christians may see it as um, something that is, uh, well, harming their conscience to use or eat meat that had been part of a pagan sacrifice. So he basically says if, if it's going to harm somebody else's conscience, uh, don't do it. He kind of ends by saying uh, that last verse of chapter 8, uh, well, last two verses, in 8, 12, and 13, when you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I'll never eat meat again, so that I will not cause him to fall. And even though this is certainly not a modern problem, we when we go to the butcher shop or go to Reesers, we don't have to worry that the meat there had been used to sacrifice to uh, Aphrodite or Apollo or Zeus. Um, that problem does not exist for our culture, but the idea of what Christian freedom entails and what we know is acceptable, but what might um, cause a, a brother or sister in Christ to uh, stumble is a real issue. And I think we ended by saying the most modern analogy or example of that would be uh, alcohol. Uh, we know Jesus drank wine, even though it was a rather weak wine. Uh, we know the Bible condemned drunkenness, but everybody drank wine in those days. But some people today, uh, alcohol is a real stumbling block. Some people have uh, alcoholism in their families. Uh, some people have had it as a personal addiction. And so we talked about how even though as a Christian there is no prohibition against drink drinking alcohol, in some occasions it would be better not to for the sake of a uh, someone else who's struggling. And that would be something that would be similar to the, the, the case or the situation the first century Corinthians faced in their decision as to whether or not to eat meat that had been a part of a pagan sacrifice. Now, you might think chapter 9, where we're starting tonight, is a radical departure from that, those two conversations about marriage and eating meat that had been a part of a, a pagan ritual. But it, it kind of continues the theme of there are things that we have the right to do, but they may not be always 
the best thing to do. That we can stand on our rights and say, well, there's nothing prohibiting me doing this. There's not, this is not sin if I were to do it. But he says, there's other times that you would refrain from something for the sake of a weaker sister or brother or for a sake of witness. And what he's going to talk about is his own life and how that conversation connects to what he said before will become a little more clear. Um, where he, you can tell he's a little frustrated and several times in this letter Paul is frustrated. Let's look at 9, 1 through 6. Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you. For you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Well, actually, let's stop there for a minute. Um, the word apostle um, means the one who has been sent. Uh, the Greek root word there uh, for apostle is the same root word that we use in the word postal or post office. Uh, uh, to, it means to send. So when you go to the post office, you were there to send a letter. So the word apostle is that same root word of post or postal. Um, so an apostle is someone who has been sent. And that gets back to when Jesus um, sends the 12, or of course after Judas, is, it's the 11. Jesus sends them and gives them this commission, you know, go make disciples. In other words, go out into the world. I'm sending you. At one time earlier, he says, I'm sending you like sheep among the wolves, but I'm sending you out. But the term apostle, really then and now, um, had a fairly narrow definition of one who had actually known Jesus before the cross. One who had actually seen Jesus face to face. One who had personal, firsthand experience with Christ. Um, so the apostles often referred specifically just either to the 12 apostles, the 12 men who traveled with Jesus, or even the wider group that still were part of that group that followed Jesus. It would include you know, Mary Magdalene, some of the other women. But, but the word apostle was often reserved for people who had had a face-to-face -face knowledge of Jesus during his earthly life. Some people said to Paul, you're not an apostle. Because we know Paul never met Jesus before the crucifixion, before the resurrection. Paul never met Jesus. Paul's encounter with Jesus is with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. That, that's Paul's encounter with Jesus when Paul is, as you know, this is quite a ways after the resurrection. Paul is, it says, you know, breathing threats against the church, arresting Christians, persecuting the church. He throwing him in jail, standing there holding the coats when they stone Stephen to death. And he gets letters from the high priest giving him authority to go to Damascus and persecute the Christians there and arrest them. And we know that as Paul is traveling to Damascus, there's a blinding light, there's a voice. This is, of course, in the book of Acts. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And Paul is blinded. Uh, Paul has this encounter with Christ on the road. And, of course, we know because of that, Paul, or Saul, who becomes known more as Paul, his Jewish name, his Roman name, or Greek name. Paul becomes, instead of an enemy of the church, its greatest missionary, at least to the Gentiles. But many have said, well, Paul, you still never met Jesus face to face. You heard a voice. You saw a blinding light. It struck you, struck you blind. But you did not personally see the face of Jesus. So, therefore, they said, you don't count as an apostle. So, and, and Paul took that as a, you know, Paul was very prickly about that. He felt that because of that special calling on the road to Damascus, he had the right to call himself 
an apostle, one who had encountered Christ. Um, that word apostle, I, I remember it being at one time years ago um, in line at, I can't remember, Six Flags, I think maybe it was, and you know, with a youth group, and I think it was when I was a youth director actually in California, and, we're, and you're in line with the youth group, and there was a different youth group from a non-denominational church in front of us, and you know, you're in the line, the little cattle line back and forth, and you start talking with somebody who's from another place. Oh, we're also a church group. And I was like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a seminary student. I'm going to be a, a pastor. And a woman from the other church said, oh, well, our pastor is an apostle. He's an apostle. And I remember thinking even then, well, is that, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's the right term, you know, usually, because the term apostle has traditionally been reserved for those who walked with Jesus in the first century. Um, and so, you know, some people today might still use that name apostle. And because a, a, the word apostle and the word disciple are not interchangeable, although they often are used interchangeably, just because an, an apostle is literally one who's been sent. Disciple, of course, comes from the same root word as discipline. Uh, somebody who is really a student under a master, under a teacher. Um, but we kind of use those words, disciple, apostle, but we, we would call ourselves disciples. I, I would be hesitant for us to call ourselves apostles, um, even though as a United Methodist pastor, I am sent. <laughs> you know, the, as opposed to some churches call their pastor, most churches call their pastor, you know, they go out and do a search and find a pastor and call him or her to be their pastor. In the Methodist Church and in the Catholic Church and in other some other denominations, you are we are sent by a bishop, so we're we're a part of the sent ministry, but we're still not usually called apostles. But anyway, so he he is saying even if other people don't call me an apostle, surely you do. I may not be an apostle to others, but I am to you. You know, he's the one who was sent to Corinth by God to plant this church. He says, you are the seal of my apostleship. And again, in the ancient world, you, I know you've seen this, documents were sealed. As in, a document would be rolled up, they'd take hot wax, <laughs> they'd pour hot wax on where the, the seam or, or where the scroll was sealed, they'd pour hot wax on it, and then people would have signet rings or some other kind of thing and put a impression into the wax that would show the authenticity of who was sending the letter. Uh, especially kings and royal officials would have an official, you know, uh, something to p put into the wax to make their seal apparent. Um, and when, when you get over, we're not getting there tonight, but thankfully we're not getting to the book of Revelation, but in the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven seals that are broken as they break the seven seals and each thing reveals a different part of the, the vision of, of Revelation. So a, a seal, uh, sometimes documents were sealed with more than one seal. Sometimes they were sealed with multiple seals. But often a king or a royal official would have it out on a ring and it would be able to put it in the wax to show that it was authentic. And of course, if the seal was broken, it meant somebody had read the letter that wasn't supposed to. You know, you, you, the letter was confidential as long as the seal was unbroken. Uh, no, you know, same way now. If, if you, you know, I had to buy some medicine at the store today, and you know that says if the seal is broken, don't don't take the medicine. You know, a different kind of seal, not a wax seal. But anyway, he says you're my seal, you Corinthians. You're my you're the sign of my authenticity. You're you're the sign of my discipleship. You know, you show your proof of my ministry. So um, he, he's defending his right to be called an apostle. And he, and he says, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. So remember, some said, well, he's no, he's no apostle. Now, Peter, there's an apostle. But this Paul fellow, he's not an apostle. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Cephas is Peter. 
Cephas is the Aramaic word for rock, just like Peter. Mm -hmm. Petros is the Greek word for rock. Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Okay, what's he, what's he upset about here? He is saying there's a double standard that some are applying to me. By this point in the ministry, most of the apostles uh, who were planting churches, preaching, teaching, going here and there to found churches, most of them did not have to have a side job. <laughs> most of them did not have, a, I mean, Peter was no longer fishing, we're to understand. Peter and Andrew were no longer having to go out on the boats every day and fish to earn a living. They were being supported by the church, by the ministry. Um, other preachers, pastors, missionaries, uh, evangelists were being supported by the churches to do their ministry. But Paul has chosen not to do that. Paul makes it a point to say, I am not taking anybody's money. <laughs> I am earning my own way. Paul continued to make tents. That was his that was his profession. He was a tent maker. Paul was very proud of the fact that he was self-supporting and self-sufficient and that the other churches, the churches were not paying his way. But here he's saying, I have a right to that money, <laughs> but I choose not to take it. I have a right to be supported, but I choose not to receive it. Um, and then he kind of goes on and, and makes a case to why pastors and evangelists and missionaries should be paid. He says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and doesn't drink the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? It's written in the law of Moses. Don't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. Do you get that imagery there? You know, we don't use ox to tread grain anymore. If you've ever been to a, a mill, and, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of mills, you know, there's a grinding <coughs> of grain. You, know, you grind the, the grain to get the, the chaff, or the, you, know, you, you grind down the grain in, in a mill. And there's a millstone, and often it's turned to, to grind the grain. And I'm really, I'm out of my depth here, really describing the mechanics of that. But, and it's usually, you know, often like there's a, be a windmill or, a, or a, a, a water, water thing that would turn the crank, that would make the thing turn and all that. Uh, if you've ever been to something like, you know, Silver Dollar City probably has that kind of stuff. Well, used to be there would be an ox going around in a circle, turning the millstone to grind the grain. And, and the law said while the ox is tied up, turning the millstone to grind the grain, you can't muzzle the ox. You gotta let the ox eat the grain while it's walking around turning the millstone. So this is another analogy that's of the same. He says, a soldier doesn't have to buy his own equipment. A guy who plants a vineyard gets to eat the grapes. <laughs> a guy who tends a flock gets to drink the goat milk. And even an ox gets to eat the grain when it's turning the millstone. And he said all of those as to say, preachers get, need to get paid. You know, which I go, amen to that, Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think you're right on target there. Um, don't muzzle the ox. But then he says, is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Us preachers, us, us missionaries. Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, 
they ought to do so in hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? So he's laying out the cake. All these other guys, including Peter, they are being financially supported in their ministry. They do not have to fish or make tents or farm or whatever. So he makes the case, basically, I deserve to be supported. I deserve to be supported. But then he says, but we did not use this right. We did not use this right. In other words, he talks about being Barnabas. When Barnabas and I were tra when Barnabas and I travel around, we don't we don't ask for payment. We don't ask for support. We don't use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what's offered at the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights. So, so he makes this point multiple times. This is something I deserve, but I don't, I don't take it. You know, and he's, he's saying, why? You know, I have the right to be supported financially, but I choose not to take it. Verse 15, I have not used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I'm not asking for money. I'd rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. <laughs> Which you might say is a little stubborn, maybe. He wants to be able to say, you know, I am doing this. I am paying my own way. I am making my own living. Nobody's paying me to do this. He, he wants to be able to say that. Yet when I... He might say, why does he, you know, he, he wants to make that boast because he's aware that there are, you know, sadly, even in the time of the first century, there were already preachers and evangelists and missionaries who were in it for the money. There were, there were so-called traveling preachers who were doing it you know, going from town to town, um, staying with people for weeks at a time, eating their food. Um, you know, I mean, there were cheaters and swindlers and con men and, and fake, you know. The, the, the TV evangelist is, uh, is a modern phenomenon, but the heart of that, of people using the gospel uh, as a, as a means to to you know, to grow wealthy and to uh, use it as a as a con is not new. It was happening in the time of Paul. It's happened every time since, you know. And you know that's one of the reasons I get so exercised about some of those guys who say, "Well, of course I have to have a nine million dollar jet, you know, um, to be able to spread the gospel." Private. Of course, I have to travel in a private jet. You know, of course, I have to have this, you know, twenty-bedroom mansion. Of course, I have to have a fleet of, of uh, Rolls Royces, and on and on and on and on. And that's why, you know, I could start really going off here, but that's why the prosperity gospel is such a sham. You know. This idea that if you're a faithful Christian, God wants you to be wealthy, financially wealthy. And that the way you get that wealth is to send it to me. You know, <laughs> you send your money to me and then God will send you wealth. The, the message of the evangelist, the TV evangelist, not all of them, of course, but far too many of the TV evangelists, especially of the scandals, is send me your seed faith money, send me your whatever, send me your your 
you know, pledge, and uh, then, you know, God will bless you financially. And, and if you've ever listened to those guys for more than 10 minutes, or, or and thankfully they're, I mean, you can, they're still on cable somewhere. Most of them are not that prevalent as they used to be. But some of them are, and, you know, and they're terrible. And it's, it's often, it falls into almost voodoo. I mean, they'll, you know, you send this money and we'll send you this tchotchke, this little, you know. I, one time, just out of curiosity, I, I got on the mailing list of one of these guys just to see what kind of scam they were running. And it was like, send me $327. You know, it, was, it, was not, it wasn't even, even a map. And if you send me $327, I'll send you this picture and you put it under your pillow for seven days and seven nights and all your bills will disappear. <laughs> all your debt will be canceled, you know, is what was in the letter. Like, if you send me this money, all your debts will go away. And that's, I mean, that's the kind of, and so that's, that, that's modern. But here he's, Paul doesn't want anyone to be able to accuse him of doing this for the money. So he wants to be able to boast, nobody is paying me. Even though he says, I have a right to it, he's not going to take it. Um, uh, I have not used any of those rights. Verse 15, I haven't used any of those rights. I'm not writing this in the hope that you'll do such things for me. I'd rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I can't boast, for I'm compelled to preach. Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching. it. So you see how this connects back to the previous chapter, although at first it's not obvious. He says, you have the right to eat that meat, there's not, nothing sinful about eating the meat. It's just meat. Apollo doesn't exist. Zeus doesn't exist. Aphrodite doesn't exist. You can eat the meat, but if you do it in front of certain people, it may wound their conscience. He says, there's nothing wrong with getting paid for being in ministry, but lest anybody criticize me and, and assign false motives to me, I'm going to do it for free so that no one can question my motives, so that nobody can say I'm in it for the money. So, um, and he says, you know, he's doing this because he is com compelled to do it. You know, God, God is making him do this. I mean, he, 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 the, the, we talk about a call to ministry in which I feel like I had, you know, um, well, I mean, I'm in my 37th year of ordained ministry, but I went to seminary in 83, but I felt the call a couple years before that. So anyway, and, I, and anytime I talk to a young person or somebody else about feeling, well, what about me going into ministry? You know, the advice is, well, unless you feel a call, you better not do it. <laughs> you, you have to have that, a call from God, because if you go into it just like, oh, that's a pretty good job, I think I'll try that, you're, you're going to be miserable. You have to have a, a call. Um, 19, though I am free and belong to no man, in other words, that way I'm not, nobody's paying me to do this, I make myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Now, you might, say, it, it, you might just read that and think... <clears throat> Is he saying he's being phony? You know, because he's saying, well, when I'm with the Jews, I, you know, I become like a Jew, those under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles, I become like a Gentile. Um, and, and, you know, in other words, I, depending on my audience, 
uh, I, you know, I act differently. So you may say, well, is he saying he's a hypocrite? Is he, is he two-faced? Is he, is he a phony baloney? No, he's not saying that. He, he's saying, I, you know, again, going back to meat. If I'm with a group of people who go, yeah, just meat, it doesn't matter. I'll eat the meat. If I'm with a group that thinks, oh, it was, you know, I was in the temple of Aphrodite where they do those really yucky, yucky stuff in there. That was put, that meat was on that altar of that pagan god. Well, I'm not gonna eat, I'm not gonna eat meat in front of them, and many other things as well. When I'm with Jews, I, he, I, I think he's saying I practice, you know, I speak Hebrew, I, uh, you know, observe the holy days, I don't eat. Pork, <laughs> uh, whatever. When I'm with Gentiles, I probably act differently, depending on who I'm with, lest I do something that would get in the way of them hearing my message. Lest I do something that would alienate them from the message I want them to hear. So I'm going to follow the customs and the practices of the people I'm with so that they will not have any barrier to hearing my message. I don't think he's trying to be a hypocrite. Um, and, you know, I, I was trying to think about, again about a, how this works in modern. Um, you know, when I, not that this is a great story for me necessarily, but when we got, when Jeannie and I were told we were going to go to Atoka <laughs> um, to be the pastor of, you know, I, I had never lived in a small town. I was from Tulsa. Then I lived in Norman and then Pasadena, California. Janine lived in Pasadena her whole life. Um, we came back after seminary and spent two years in Oklahoma City as an associate. So when we moved to Atoka, we had never lived in a small town. And you know, when you move and live in a small town, you have to adjust your, <laughs> your way of life to a small town life. You know, you, you have to live a different sort of lifestyle not I, I, you know what I mean you, you you things go differently in a small town and you can't sort of impose your city mentality when you're living in a town of 2,500 people you have to speak a different language Janine says that literally my Oklahoma accent got thicker when we lived in <laughs> Atoka <laughs> you know um, that I didn't have that much of an accent at least well People in California thought I did, but um, people in Oklahoma often thought I was from California because I didn't have a very heavy Oklahoma accent. Um, part of that was because I'd done speech and drama and, and all those kinds of things. And when I did my very first play in high school, one of my lines was something like, uh, you mean you're going to have to go to Washington? And the, and the teacher's like, there's no R in that word. <laughs> There's no R in there. It's Washington. It's not Washington. It's Washington. <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> um, things like that. Um, but when you live in Atoka, Oklahoma, and you know your probably your most prominent church member is a dairy farmer, and you know the, another one works for the FF. You know, for the I mean, it, it's an agricultural community primarily. Um, you dress differently, you, and you, you, spend, you, know, you go down to the coffee shop and you eat at the diner and the truck stop and you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I've heard stories of pastors who were from the city getting sent to those places and they haven't adjusted to the lifestyle of a small town and they don't, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work very well in the, uh, to, to not adjust to the culture. So I think what Paul is saying is I, I adjust to the culture that I'm in um, so that I can present the gospel. Not in a phony way, um, but just in a way of being able to relate to people of all different backgrounds. Um, he says, I do it for the sake of the gospel, there in verse 23. Then going on, 24. Don't you know that in a race... All the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. 
But we do it to get a crown that'll last forever. Therefore, I don't run like a man running aimlessly, and I don't fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You know, here he's just talking about his own approach to ministry, which is um, he is, you know, relentless. One of the, you know, I say one of the great things and also just true things, if you, if you read about some of the great Christian leaders, or probably great leaders, period, but especially I'm most familiar with great Christian leaders, um, Paul, Martin Luther, you know, John Wesley, they were all relentless. I mean, they were all they only had one one speed, and that was go. I mean, they, you know, and that's, I say Wesley was a terrible husband. Um, they are so single-minded in, in the pursuit of ministry that they, you know, they, there was no, there was really no uh, vacations into that. Uh, and Paul is just talking about how he, he trains himself, even in, including physically training his body to be able to go at that level and go at that speed all the time. And of course, when he talks about the games, remember, we're in the Roman Empire. In, in, in uh, Corinth is the home of, I mentioned this when we first started, the home of the Isthmian Games, because Corinth is on an isthmus, um, which was the second largest games in the empire. The first one were the, was the Olympics. Um, the Olympics was the largest games, but the Isthmian games were the second largest games in the Roman Empire, and in Greek, in the Greek culture before that, and and it's you know that's where the modern Olympics comes from. And the race, of course, in those days there weren't there was no Winter Olympics, and you know there's <laughs> no not many of the sports that we now have in the Olympics, but there was racing, wrestling. Racing, wrestling, um, I can't remember what else there was. There, were, there was like a handful of, of games that were a part of that. Um, and so he says, I, I'm, I'm training to win the, win the crown. And of course, the crown, they didn't give out gold medals. They gave out laurels, you know, a, a crown made of leaves, a crown made of flowers, which, is, which was called a laurel, which is what my name comes from. Lawrence comes from that. Um, and so you would win if you won the race. They would put a crown of, of leaves on your head. Um, and he says, you, re you win to get the laurel. And within a few days, it's brown and dead. <laughs> you know, it's not like a gold medal. It's, 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 it dies. He says, you're running for a crown that doesn't last. But in the Christian life, we're running for, a, for a something that does last. The, the crown of, of, of glory, the crown that, um, you know, if you go again to the book of Revelation, it talks about, you know, the crown, we cast our crowns before the throne of, of, of Christ. So Paul is a, as I've said before, when, when God gets a hold of Paul, he changes his direction 180 degrees from persecutor of the church to missionary for the church. But his personality change is pretty much the same personality. When he, when he was persecuting the church, he was going 100 miles an hour. And once he becomes uh, an apostle of the church, he still is going 100 miles an hour. It's just he's going in the opposite direction. But his personality of uh, relentlessness is, is the same, which you might say, well, that's why God picked him <laughs> to, to do what he, what he did. So that's, that's chapter 9. Now... Chapter 10, again, um, he's still on this idea of freedom versus responsibility. Be because this is something that the early church really was struggling with, and especially, obviously, they were struggling with in Corinth. And, and, you know, in a lot of modern Christianity, it's still a struggle to get, to find the right balance in this message. We are saved not by our works, we're saved by grace. But 
If you only say that, some people will think, okay, well, then it doesn't matter what I do. Since I'm saved by grace and not by my works, I can do anything I want. I, can, I don't have to follow any rules. You know? and, and, of course, Paul is fighting against that. <laughs> the idea that, that, that grace gives you a free ride to do and do anything you want. Because it's not, you're not saved by your deeds, you're saved by the grace of God. The opposite of that is people who, you know, what Martin Luther would call works righteousness, what, what Luther and the whole Protestant Reformation was about, emphasizing that we're not saved by our works, we're saved by grace. But people, you know, the Pharisees believed that you were, they were saved by their works. And there's plenty of Christian Pharisees today. You know, we talked... I mean, we talked last week when we were talking about the whole meat and idols. I mean, there have always been Christian Pharisees who say, what's Christianity? What it? Well, Christianity means you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't go to movies, you don't play cards, you don't dance, you don't do da 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 They reduce Christianity to a series of do's and don'ts, which is works. That's not grace. Really, that's reducing Christianity to a list of rules, and that's not Christianity. And that, that's the Pharisees. That's, and, you know, there's unfortunately plenty of churches that have a very Pharisaic approach to Christianity. Um, so Paul is always saying, just because you have the, the freedom doesn't mean that it's good for you. <laughs> just because you have the freedom doesn't mean that you should do it. Because it's harmful to yourself or to others. So that's what chapter 10 is about. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers. I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. Okay, now who's he talking about here? Yeah, he's talking about the children of Israel and who, who came out of slavery, came out of bondage in Egypt. He's going to go back and use a lot of examples from that. You know, I don't want you to be ignorant. Think about our forefathers. They passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Now, if you remember when you talk about drinking from the rock, go back to Numbers 20 for a minute. In the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers 20. If you remember this part of the story of Moses and the wilderness and the children of Israel. Um, um, they're, you know, they're wandering in the desert. Numbers 20, verse 2. Now, there was no water for the community because they are in a desert. Okay. There was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, Oh, if only we died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into the desert that we and our livestock would die out here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting. It's also called the tabernacle. And fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together, speak to that rock before their eyes, and it'll pour out its water. You'll bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. But Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? And Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. What did he do wrong? What did Moses do wrong? Did God tell him to strike it? <laughs> Even once? No. <laughs> no, he said, speak to the rock. He didn't say anything about hitting it. 
The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you didn't trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you'll not bring this community in the land I give them. That's why Moses doesn't cross over the Jordan into the promised land. Because he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. But you might go, really? But yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why Moses doesn't cross over. These were the waters of Meribah. You know what the word Meribah means? Quarreling. <laughs> the waters of quarreling. For the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he showed himself holy among them. So don't name your child Meribah. <laughs> so he's, he, he's saying, but Paul is saying, remember the Israelites, I mean he says, think about, think about the Israelites for a minute. And some of this is kind of um, unsaid. Think about the Israelites. What miracles they saw. They saw, I mean, the ten plagues. You know, they saw all the plagues that fell on Egypt. They saw, you know, Pharaoh finally let him go. They saw the waters part, and the, then the waters destroy the armies of Pharaoh. I mean, they saw, they, they were led through the desert by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So, you know, he's saying, think about them. Talking about they got the water from the rock. Verse 5. Nevertheless, God wasn't pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Remember, the, the older generation who came out of Egypt, they didn't get to go across the Jordan either because of their constant bickering and quarreling and disobedience. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Don't be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. People sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. You know, that's, that's what they were doing with the, with the golden calf. They were reveling. We shouldn't commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We shouldn't test the Lord, as some of them did. And they were killed by snakes. Don't grumble, as some of them did. They were killed by the destroying angel. Now... Again, just to remember some of these things. Of course, the, the golden calf episode is in Exodus 32. Um, some people, about people dying, uh, where he says uh, 23,000 of them died. Numbers 25. Go back to Numbers for a minute. Numbers 25. So, this is another episode while they're in the desert. Numbers 25. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping the Baal, or the Baal of Peor. And the Lord's anger burned against them. And the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people, kill them, and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to Israel's judges, Each of you must put to death those of your men who have joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor. Then an Israelite man brought to his family a Midianite woman right before the eyes of Moses and the whole assembly of Israel while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest saw this, he left the assembly, took a spear in his hand, and followed the Israelite into the tent, drove the spear through both of them, through the Israelite and into the woman. Then the plague against the Israelites was stopped, but those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. Any... Nitpickers? Nitpickers here? What's, what's nitpicking? 23,000. Yeah, Paul said 23,000. The number says it was 24,000. Paul is probably writing from memory. <laughs> you know, easy access to the scrolls 
like the scroll of numbers was not something that he carried around with him. He didn't have he didn't have a pocket Old Testament with him. He didn't have the Bible app on his iPhone. Um, you know, so he's probably from memory saying they killed twenty three thousand. Well, actually, it follows twenty four thousand. But um, you know, that's the kind of thing that if we are understanding Paul writing these letters, really shouldn't bother us if somebody is believing that every word is a dictation of God then it's a problem um, that there's a discrepancy there um, so he says and they killed them and uh, the snakes remember the snakes <laughs> let's look up the snakes just before we move on the serpents is numbers 21 that numbers has a lot of they, they had a lot of problems in numbers <laughs> Numbers 21. Um, uh, Numbers 21. They traveled, this is still the Israel, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Dead Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, <sighs> Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. I assume they were talking about the manna at that point. So then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Now, just for the sake of trivia, go to 2 Kings 18. This is hundreds of years later, of course. Hundreds of years later in 2 Kings. 2 Kings 18. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, this is places for pagan worship, smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles, those are all fertility gods. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. So across the centuries, the snake that was used to cure the snake bites back in the time of Moses had become, guess what? An idol. <laughs> it had to be smashed. Is this where the doctor's uh, serpents uh, across uh, comes from? I, I actually think it comes from a Greek... Um, I, I've looked at, I, I used to think that, surely it came from that. I think it actually... Any nurses or doctors here? The, the, the symbol that we're talking about with the snake for healing? Yeah, I think it goes into Greek mythology instead of this, I think. But I wouldn't swear to it. But um, Anyway, so Paul, why is Paul bringing all this up? He's saying, think about, you know, the Israelites, they... They'd seen the miracles of God. <laughs> and still, all these times, they grumbled, they disobeyed, they worshipped false idols, they, you know, they kept doing all these things that they shouldn't have done. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. 
So, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. In other words, remember the, the Corinthians, Paul felt had uh, had a puffed up idea of their own spirituality. They, you know, we we've, we've got it all done, we got it all figured out. You know, we're we're pretty spiritually mature now. He's like, basically, be careful. You know, be careful that you don't trip up and fall. Um, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. He's just, you know, these are new Christians. These are first-generation Christians who came out of paganism. And some of them came out of Judaism, but a lot of them came out of paganism. And, and they've become very puffed up. They have become... Uh, Divided into subgroups, you know, we follow Paul, we follow Peter, well, we follow Apollos. Remember, they have all these divisions. He's like, watch yourself. Just, just watch yourself. Verse 14. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. This is actually part of the communion liturgy. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, no. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. I don't want you to be participants with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You can't have a part in both in the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You're just saying, be careful about, you know, he's already said, the meat is just, you can eat the meat, but just don't get too puffed up about this. Don't get too reckless about getting too involved with these pagan temples and, and getting too close to, to what your former life, and then he's going to go on. And I say, remember, this whole conversation is about what is, what is permissible and what is wise. What, what you can do and what you should do. What you are allowed to do in freedom, but what is the better choice. That's why here he, he's quoting at the beginning of verse 23, 1023. Everything is permissible. That's in my Bible, that's in quotes, as if he's <laughs> quoting a, a phrase. Everything's permissible, but not everything's beneficial. Everything's permissible, again in quotes, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for... The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He's saying, you know, yes, you have, you're free to eat the meat. <laughs> and by, uh, you know, that has implications for things beyond the meat. There's many things as a Christian we have the freedom to do that the Jews did not do. You know, there is freedom in Christ. He says, so we have freedom, but not everything is wise or, or, or constructive or beneficial. He says, if some unbeliever, in other words, a pagan, verse 27, if some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. You know, just if they put, put the food in front of you, don't say, now, was this, uh, was this actually used in a temple sacrifice? Uh, was this meat sacrificed to Aphrodite? Uh, don't ask any questions. If, they, if you're eating with a non-believer and they give you a meal, just eat it. Don't, don't ask questions. Just eat it. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of <laughs> advice they often give to you know, mission teams going to another culture. <laughs> you know, if you're going to another culture and you're on a mission, you're a mission team and you're in some other place and they put food in front of you that looks like something you've never eaten before, just, usually the advice is just, just eat it. <laughs> no, don't ask a lot of questions. Just... <laughs> Now, of course, sometimes that could cause dietary <laughs> or uh, in in intestinal issues, I realize. But if you don't want to insult your host, 
if you're the guest of some like in a foreign country or you're the guest of somebody else and they put something in front of you and you're not really sure what it is i mean the polite thing is just don't ask questions just just eat it <laughs> so he says that's what he says to do but if anyone says to you this has been offered in a sacrifice i mean in other words you're at the house and they go hey we got something really special you know this is this is fresh from the temple of Zeus. I mean, we sacrificed it to mighty Zeus just yesterday, you know, and they're like, hey, you know, aren't you excited about eating this, this sacrifice? <laughs> he says, if they do that, then don't eat it, <laughs> both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. The other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. Why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So it, it's, it's not a, it's like you have to kind of navigate this. It's not just, you know, very simple. It's, it's kind of a little complex to make sure your freedom doesn't cause somebody else to stumble. So he kind of sums it up by saying this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. <laughs> Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews or Greeks or the church, even as I try to please everybody in every way. I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Um, you, know, you might just say, he's kind of saying, just you know, use common sense. Don't do something that's going to make somebody else upset. Don't do something that's going to make somebody else's faith waver. You know, it's not worth it. Well, I deserve to eat this food. I mean, don't, or I need, you know, I know these people don't drink, but I, you know, I'm going to have a beer. I mean, it's just not worth it. It's just not, it's not worth it to wound somebody else to, you know, whatever that thing might be. Larry, can we go back to the beginning of uh, chapter 10? Yeah. Uh, Paul is talking to the Corinthians, uh, and he's saying, uh, and I would imagine that there's both Gentiles and Jews. Right, there. yeah, Gentiles. But would the Gentiles know uh, that our ancestors were under the cloud and passed through the sea and so forth? Um, some of them wouldn't, yeah. So the Gentiles, I mean, unless their Jewish, now Jewish Christian friends had shared some of that with them. Um, I mean, remember, for the in the early church, the only scripture the early church had was the Old Testament. I mean, they would they get letters from people like Paul, but when it came time in the early church for them to read scripture, when they talk about scripture, they're talking about the Old Testament. So probably in these churches, they had learned something of that heritage and something about that. Um, you know, the... Sometimes you see it like sometimes you see like in Luke especially, um, which is written to a more Gentile audience. You'll see Luke when he talks about something Jewish, he'll give you a little explanation of it, or he'll explain you know what it is because he knows his audience doesn't isn't familiar with that. Um, but I think they're probably if they were fairly new Christians fresh from paganism, they probably wouldn't necessarily know that. But and so the person in Corinth, who's now gotten the letter from Paul, who's reading the letter from Paul to the congregation, he might have to stop and do what I just did. Now, remember, here's the they might have to go back and tell the story of Moses to put it in context before they finished reading the letter, you know, to, to help the people there know what he was talking about. You know, this is almost written in code. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. if you didn't know, didn't remember the Old Testament and the Exodus, the mm -hmm. cloud, yeah. you know, uh, is it thunder, uh, thunderstorm clouds that he's talking about or what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, of course, that's one of the secrets of, or not secret, but one of the lessons of any kind of missionary work or evangelism is um, you have to kind of know your audience. And um, sadly, in our culture today, um, biblical literacy <laughs> is is pretty low among the general population. I mean, they are. They do these surveys of just the general population, like can you name the four Gospels? Most Americans cannot name the four Gospels. Um, On TV recently, they yeah. were asking the crowds in New York City uh, what two countries border the United States. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, answers like Russia. <laughs> so these were adults. Well, yeah, I mean. <laughs> not gender dark. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not just biblical uh, lack of knowledge. It's, it's probably lack of uh, lots of knowledge that unfortunately is existent. They, there was, uh, I know, I know Jay Leno, when he was still the host of The Tonight Show, he used to do a segment where he would go to, he'd be at a, like a college graduation. <laughs> and as the kids were coming out, he would do kind of man on the street interviews and ask them those kind of questions. What are the two countries that border the United States? I mean, just they, and unfortunately, of course, the ones they showed, of course, were the, the, the funny ones where they didn't know the answer. And you'd think, these are people who just graduated college and they didn't know. Um, one, time, one of those questions was, how many moons does the Earth have? And you'd be surprised how many people did not say one. <laughs> I think we saw the same skip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was even a, there was a, some, something popped up on. <laughs> how, many, so, how many states are there? Yeah. How many states are there? Uh, how many senators are in the Senate? Um, you know, what are the three, three branches, branches of, of government? government? Yeah. yeah um, what's the name of the vice president? Uh, yeah, there was a skit that popped up on my feed for some reason. It was a Saturday Night Live skit, but from way back, like 20 years ago. And it, Steve Martin was the host, and it was a, a, a phony game show that was called Common Knowledge. <laughs> and the, the premise of the skit was um, all, all the questions were uh, written by uh, Princeton professors, and all the answers were supplied by 17 year old high school juniors <laughs> and so you had to the, the answer was like that one of the category was state capitals you know and it's like what's the capital of Oklahoma Oklahoma City what's the capital of Texas Texas City what's the capital of Missouri Missouri City what's the capital of Colorado Colorado City <laughs> um, you know like lightning round uh, you know uh, when was uh, when was the Civil War in 1945? You know, it's, I mean, just that kind of stuff. You know, just, you know, I, I mean, it, it, exaggerating, but unfortunately, a little too close to the truth about. But yeah, if you think it's, it's it's really bad when it comes to if they do general surveys of the American population about Christianity. Um, I say, who were? Can you name two of the disciples? Can you name the Two of the Gospels. Can you? Um, I mean, you know, it just what happened on Easter? <laughs> um, what were Jesus's? Uh, you know, what's Jesus's mother's name? I mean, just things that you would think even people outside the church would know, but but they don't anymore. Um, used to be, if you read, used to be people not only, of course, of course, the Bible used to be one of the primary textbooks in school. Uh, used to be not only would people get all the biblical references, they would get all the Shakespeare references too. <laughs> you know, I mean, so you know, things have changed quite a bit. Um, th this last part is probably one of the most challenging parts of one of Paul's letters. Chapter eleven is very well. At least the first half of chapter eleven. Okay. And I've actually referenced this a few times in sermons. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now, I'm, I'm going to kind of read this whole thing at, at once and then come back. Now, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's just as though her head were shaved. If a woman doesn't cover her head, she should have cut her hair off. And if it's a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he's the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man didn't come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. 
For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Where shall we start? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I, uh, I had a man call me a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, and he said um, he would like to come by the church and ask me a question and see our sanctuary. And he doesn't go to our church. Okay. So he came by, he wanted to see the cushion, the kneeler cushions, because his, I think his mother or his grandmother or somebody had helped to, to make those, you know, the needlepoint or, or whatever they are, cross stitch or, I'm, you all tell me what they are. But they're, they were, are they needlepoint? Is that what they are? Yeah, okay, they're needlepoint, right. So he wanted to see those because uh, some of his family had made some of those. And he also wanted to hear about, like, tell me what's happening in the Methodist Church with all the everything. You know, I, I didn't have time to go in, I mean, I gave him the five minute version, which is, you know, but. And, uh, you know, and I just said, you know, there's this wide spectrum of Christianity. I said, you know, there's, there's far left and far right and, and, and mi middle ground. And I said, you know, you've got folks on the, on the far left who are very, very progressive. And you've got folks on the far right who are fundamentalist and da 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 da, da. And he's like, well, I'm a fundamentalist. He says, you know, I believe every, everything in the Bible is true. I said, I said oh, so, so all the women in your church cover their heads. He's like, well, no. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. I said, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that he spends a whole chapter, or at least half a chapter, saying that all women should cover their heads. So if you're a fundamentalist and believe every word is literal, then surely, I guess I was getting a little, <laughs> surely your women all cover their heads. Well, no, we, uh, you know, and of course he didn't have any response for that. Um, this, this passage, you know, is one where people who say they take every word of the Bible literally, well, the Amish do. I mean, the Amish have their women cover their head. Other than the Amish, not many Christian groups, even fundamentalist <coughs> groups, that require their women to cover their heads. Um, this is a this is an example of Paul talking in the culture of his day. Um, in that culture, in the first century, in, in that culture, especially among Judaism, but even among you know, Roman women, I've said this before, for a woman to walk around with her head uncovered was to advertise that she was a loose woman, that she was a prostitute. A woman with an uncovered head, that was, would be like a woman walking around, you know, in lingerie today, I mean, on the streets or whatever. I mean, walking, you know, the, at least in movies, you see the, the prostitutes on the street in the, with the miniskirts and the fishnet hose and the bustiers and they're leaning into the cars and everybody can tell, oh, these are prostitutes who are looking for clients. Well. In that culture, a woman with her head uncovered was basically saying, I'm a prostitute. Um, and that was that culture. And, you know, this is where, you know, even usually, even the most conservative Christian will have to understand and say, there are some parts of the Bible that are for that time and for that culture that are not eternal eternal rules, eternal laws. Now, there was a time not, I mean, probably, I don't know how far back you'd have to go in America, where women did wear hats to church. <laughs> um, that, 
probably was that probably was up through maybe the fifties, maybe even sixties. Now, I'm not sure how many of those women knew that they were doing it because of 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 11. Um, I mean, that's why, that's where it came, that's why the tradition of women wearing hats to church came from, was because of this. I mean, no, but it was like, it went from wearing, covering your head all the time to, well, okay, maybe not all the time, but at least at church, you know. And so it became, okay, at least at church, since that's where we're going to be praying and all that, we better cover our heads. And of course, what do we, men, what do we do when it's time to pray? Take off our hats, right? Did you ever wonder why? <laughs> but one of the things, verse what, 14, it talks about a man having long hair. Yeah. Didn't Christ have long hair? Well, I don't know. We got any pictures of him in here? Well, I mean, <laughs> all the ones I've seen, I remember him having long hair. Jewish men also often wore, uh, you know, something on their head. But yeah, I mean, most, I make most scholars believe, well, I, I guess, how long is long? I mean, I Jewish women, I mean, we're talking, they, I mean, it would be down, if they undid their hair, it would be down, all the way down their back. I mean, long and, long is a relative term, of, you know, what, is, what constitutes long hair. But you know, in the 1960s, Many a father said to his son, <laughs> if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace to him. You know, many a man whose sons were starting to... Did wear... you hear my dad say that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, that that's, this was used... I mean, there, there's a, a term for that, of, of, uh, sometimes called proof texting, or, uh, uh, you know, where you take a verse out of context mm -hmm. and use it to make a point and you know that would be a good example of that of, of to preach against uh, boys having long hair well that's right here uh, but culturally and, and if you've been following the news um, oh, yeah. Yeah. what's happening in Iran yeah, that's what yeah. right now yeah. Yeah. in Iran right now they, they have what they call the morality police and women must wear the head covering, you know. Uh, Tightly. The, the, uh, Tightly. Yeah, the, the hajib, in, 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 uh, because their fundamentalist uh, understanding of, of Islam is that, uh, same reason, a woman with an uncovered head is, is, a, is a prostitute, is a, is a loose woman. Uh, and so they enforce the hajib uh, for the women of Iran, and if they're caught outside their home without their head covered, the morality police will arrest them and sometimes beat them. Um, and the young women of Iran are saying, you know, of course, I mean, then the, <laughs> the irony of it, nowhere in the Quran does it say that women have to wear that all the time. So was that a cultural thing of this? Yeah, it, yeah. Through? yeah, it's a culture. But, it, you know, it, it, the, the, the problem with, uh, well, there's a lot of problems with Islam, just as there are with, you know, problems with, our, with churches too. But um, it is illegal in Islam to translate the Quran out of um, the original language and out of Arabic. So most Muslims have never actually read the Quran if they don't speak Arabic. And it's illegal to have a translation of it. So they are totally dependent upon a imam or, or some other religious leader telling them what's in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Much like 500 years ago in Christianity, most people were illiterate. Before the invention of the printing press, most people couldn't read and couldn't read the Bible. And so they were dependent on the priest to tell them what God wanted and what God didn't want. You know, and if the priest said, talked about you need to pay to get out of purgatory and da da da, da all these things, the, the common people they couldn't read, they, they, they didn't own a Bible. Um, now, if you want to really get into some sort of really 
odd little bits of thing here is one of the comments here that he says, um, um, he says 10, verse 10, 11, 10, for this reason and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. Now, what does that mean? What do the angels have to do with it? Well, here's what most scholars believe he's referring to here. Go back to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. This is the leading up to the flood. This is, this is the passage that leads up right before the flood. So at the beginning of chapter 6, Genesis, uh, Genesis 6. When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. <laughs> okay. And the movie Noah, those giant things that built the ark. <laughs> that well, that movie's a bunch of garbage, but I mean, uh, <laughs> that, that movie is 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 trash. I mean, um, yeah, anybody who comes out of that thinks they know the story of Noah is is that's the but, but what at least, now this is is at least what uh, most scholars, if you try to read the plain meaning of this passage, the sons of God. Is angels right. and the sons of the angels are attracted to human women okay. and it seems to imply that when the angels mate with the human women the Nephilim are the result oh, okay. which are the mighty men the men of legend now so this is part of Jewish mythology you might so, but, but many, that, is, that was an interpretation by some Jews that, um, the, that there was a time in which angels were tempted by human females. And that they think that when Paul is saying there, for this reason and because of the angels, a woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In other words, a woman ought to cover her head so that she wouldn't be a temptation even to the angels. That's some pretty, I know, really kind of freaky kind of stuff there to think about. Um, but um, that is the most plain meaning of the text. Now, some would say, well, sons of God could just mean people, too. But the way it's phrased, it seems to make a differentiation between the sons of God and the daughters of men. It seems to be making this, this that these are two different groups. So... I'm not saying that that's exactly what it means. I'm just saying that's one of the interpretations and why they explain that these, the Nephilim, the, the mighty men, the men of legend, that was their, that's where they came from. But as I have often said, uh, when, before you get to the call of Abraham, I think that most of the stories in Genesis are, are more better understood as, as parables than they are as, as history. But it's okay to disagree about that too. But uh, this is, of course, there's the head covering part. There's also the part that seems to imply, of course, that what was common knowledge and what was commonly believed in that day was that women were inferior to men. I mean, uh, that, you know, he says, you know, the Christ is the head of the man and, and the man is the head of the woman. Uh, in practice, in Judaism, the woman, the wife, was the property of the man. Um, as were the daughters. So that, that was the reality in that time and in that culture. Now, Paul, in his later writings, is much more, 
I mean, some have said for his day, Paul is a feminist. Uh, because when Paul says things in Christ, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, free nor slave. Paul actually elevates the role of women quite a bit higher than most other rabbis or people of the day. Paul's, Paul's, what, what Paul says about women is actually, excuse me, pretty enlightened compared to the general, you know, understanding of the day. Um, you know, even when he says uh, things like wives obey your husbands, um, and, but he says husbands love your wives in that rather, you know, passage that preachers are always afraid to preach about. Um, but, um, you know, this is coming from a very paternalistic culture. Uh, this is coming from a very, um, a, a culture where women are under the total authority of their husbands or their fathers. Um, but what I find most interesting about it is how Paul, you know, when he says in verse 14, doesn't the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace? And if a woman has long hair, it's her glory? It's like, he's like saying like, how could you possibly think otherwise? I mean, it's so obvious. You know, to him, it is just like, well, you know, the sky is blue. And, you know, I mean, it, it is to him just, of course, that's the reality. But, you know, we're that way about things too. I mean, maybe not things quite as, I mean, we're like, well, of course you eat bacon and eggs for breakfast <laughs> or something, you know, or in other cultures, no, they don't. Or, you know, well, of course, I, I mean, there's things that we think of as, well, it's obvious to everyone that this is reality until you go to another culture or another town or another country or another language. And, you, and the thing that you think is, well, of course, it's obvious to everyone. It's not obvious to everyone. And it's not just where he says, well, of course, doesn't the very nature of things tell you this? Um, you know, and, and you could find all kinds of examples of people thinking something is obviously true that history later says, well, actually, no, that actually wasn't true. Um, you know. Um, isn't it obvious that a door should be rectangular? Well, not if you're a hobbit, it's round. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um. Larry, <laughs> when I was reading that, you know, even in you know, World War II, the women were heads were shaved that mixed up with the German army, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. And isn't it it's interesting that 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 is such a sign of shame. Yeah, the, sha the shaved head for a woman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To have her head shaved. Uh huh. Because it, because her hair is her. Yeah. It says it's her glory. Yeah. It says the woman's hair is her glory. You know. I mean, yes, that's a long time ago, but not that long ago. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, no, as I said. Hair is still pretty important to a lot of women. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me, I mean, that there's a reason that beauty shops charge quite a bit, right? I mean, they, <laughs> <laughs> hair, hair seems to be still a pretty significant thing for most women. Um, and uh, I mean, a very personal thing and a very, I mean, yeah, I mean, when women have through uh, chemo or whatever, when women lose their hair, I mean, it's a, it's a big deal, right? And it's still odd to see a bald woman, you know. In the first Star Trek movie, the, the, one of the women is bald. You're like, oh, that's strange. You know. uh, <laughs> well, we're out of time. We'll pick up the next section of First Corinthians. We'll start, we'll pick up after this, but um, I say it's just a reminder that um, you know, I, I firmly believe that Paul is inspired and that the scriptures are inspired, but I also believe that Paul is speaking from a certain cultural standpoint, and, and he's, he's a man of his time. He's a man of his day. Um, that doesn't mean, that doesn't cancel out the, the, the fact that God is leading him and inspiring him, but he still is a man of his time and of his day. And you can't expect Paul to speak like a 21st century person. You, you can't expect him to have a 21st century understanding, you know, just like somebody 
in the 31st century would probably think the way we think of it in the 21st century is how could they possibly think that a thousand years ago? Um, you know, if, if we can last that long as a, as a species before Jesus comes back. But, um, you know, there are cultural things that are in the Bible that we have to, and, and it's always the, the challenge is something like this. Is this something of God, women covering their heads. Is that a commandment of God forever and ever and ever and ever? Or is that something that is cultural that is no longer relevant for our time and place? You know, and sometimes that's what Christians fight about as to whether or not a certain thing is still relevant in this time and place that was culturally significant in a different time and place. You know, and we could talk about slavery and we could talk about all kinds of things like that. Um, so why don't we pray? Lord, we are thankful for, uh, for Paul, for his passion that comes through every page of his letters, his, his desire to put everything aside that might hinder his ability to share Christ. Um, Lord, we want some of that passion. Uh, we thank you that, um, that he was um, called and chosen and that because of him, so many people came to know the Lord. And we thank you that he was able to continue to influence even us today. Um, we thank you for men and women throughout the last 2,000 years who have been passionate about their desire to follow you and to share that good news and help us to be passionate about it as well. Amen. All right. We're not going to meet next week. It's fall break, and we don't have all, we don't have everything going. So we're going to take next week off, but don't, don't, don't get, don't backslide. Come back in two weeks, okay? <laughs> Come back in two weeks. Okay.